go. Before the surgery or what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, yeah. Okay, cool. Your head was totally in the way. Now it's just mostly in the way. Okay. So I'm presenting today. This is a case conference. This is uh, more happy doctors. It's a clue. Uh, so, patient presentation. So, 32 year old African American male. He's got a history of hypertension. Initially comes to the ER on the 20th of August with complaints of fever, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, headache. Uh, he is diagnosed with gastritis, given some uh, promethazine, and sent home. Comes back on the 22nd with all of the above sy symptoms plus altered mental status. So, uh, when the first people to see him write the H&P saying he's initially kind of slow to answer questions. He does give a history of smoking some marijuana earlier that day, um, as well as taking promethazine. Uh, and the family member that was in the room said he was having jerking like motions after taking the promethazine. So uh, social history has 10 children, uh, has been in jail five times, uh, moved recently from Orlando to Memphis, uh, no history of TB exposure for family members. So, uh, physical examination. This is all taken. I, I actually didn't see this patient initially. This is all taken from uh, the initial H and P and uh, initial neurology notes. Um, so initially, temperature is thirty eight point five when it comes in. Heart rate one hundred and thirty two. High blood pressure one ninety one over ninety eight. Uh, breathing thirty times, but setting one hundred percent. EKG shows sinus tac. Uh, so on his physical examination, he's got some sort of weird. Uh, findings. He has opsiclonus, which is uh, a vertical and horizontal nystagmus. Um, also, some decreased upper extremity reflexes compared to the lower extremity. Uh, the initial H and P note notes neck stiffness, but all subsequent uh, evaluations don't note this. Um, and he is becoming more and more lethargic. So his initial labs when he comes in, white count is obviously elevated. Um, Platelet count's a little low. The creatinine, it's difficult to tell if that's his baseline or not. Uh, when he came in on the 20th, it was 1.37. Uh, it was 1.31 when he came in. Um, uh, liver function tests, analyst lipase are all normal. He has a slight troponin leak. Uh, it's 0.39. Uh, HIV, RPR, HEP panel are negative. A UDS is done, which strangely does not include THC, uh, which uh, he apparently admitted to smoking earlier that day. Um, but Everything else on the drug panel, it was an expanded, so it included salicylates, acetaminophen, are all negative. And the initial blood and urine cultures are also negative. So, uh, so workup is done in the ER. Um, due to his rigidity, he's, they're unable to get an LP initially, so he started on bromocryptine for suspected NMS, uh, they think it was from Fenergan. Uh, he's also started on bank rocephin, acyclovir, and doxy uh, for more of a broad spec encephalitis. Was there any history of cantaloupe ingestion? Yeah, I just heard about that yesterday, actually, the cantaloupe yeah. ingestion. I had a patient that told me, oh, I've been eating cantaloupe, and uh, now I have salmonella. So uh, not that I know of. Then again, like I said, all of this history is taken from notes. So, uh, so as, as his hospitalization progresses, the next day the patient was now only responsible, responsive to painful stimuli. Uh, on the 26th, if you remember he came in on the 22nd, uh, again, having hypotension, agonal breathing, uh, no gag re reflex, he's intubated. Those are his gases there after the intubate him. Uh, BAL is done, showing 2,000 white blood cells, 84% neutrophils, gross MSSA and step epi. Um, idea at this point of seeing him. He started on Linnaeus and Avalox. Uh, so neuro testing that's done on him. EMG and nerve conduction velocities show uh, distal sensimor sensimotor polyneuropathy and uh, denervation. And an EEG that's performed shows a moderate to severe encephalopathy, low altitude, I'm sorry, low amplitude delta waves. Uh, if you remember, the sister was saying that he had seizure-like activity. They tried doing photaic stim uh, and are unable to elicit any seizure activity. Lumbar puncture is finally done on the 23rd, which is the day after he comes in. Um, and he had already been on antibiotics. Protein's 99, glucose is 66, white count is 165, and 66% lymphocytes, five RBCs. Opening pressure is sli only slightly elevated at 28. 
uh, MRI and CT of the brain um, and spine have no abnormalities. So what is in your differential, and I just put up there some of the sort of key features of his uh, physical examination, neuro workup, so rapid decline mental status, oxyclonus, uh, lymph... Okay, so things in the differential, they can include, uh, and of course our testing sort of gets rid of some of these things, but interprinkable hemorrhage, of course he has a negative CT MRI. Viral encephalitis, as you guys mentioned. Uh, one of the things I looked at, the, you know, always remember the differential, acute disseminated encephal encephalomyelitis, which is a uh, uh, post-infectious or post-vaccine uh, picture. It's very similar to, MR to MS, uh, but he does have an, a negative MRI, and you would expect to see uh, uh, lesions. Uh, and vasculitis. At the bottom there, it's very difficult to read, I'm very sorry. Um, this is from the IDSA. Uh, in your encephalitis sort of differential, they have these different charts, things that you look at from the history. And this is the neurological findings section. Um, and you're looking at things on here like um, cerebral ataxia, cranial nerve abnormalities, rhombo rhomboencephalitis. Things in, the, in those differentials include, like you said, viral, herpes simplex, Varicella, Listeria, um, West Nile, St. Louis. So you guys, you guys were dead on. Uh, Japanese encephalitis. So a lot of the different flavia viruses. So, uh, so I just consulted early on. Uh, so we order a million different tests, include uh, so Crag fungal cultures, stains, AFB stains, and CSF. So the pneumococcal antigen, herpes, enterovirus, adenovirus, toxo, VZB, CMV, wet prep. Um, all negative, uh, HIV viral load done directly on the CSF is less than 75. Um, Tulariasis, leptospira, quantiferon gold, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, all negative. The West Nile virus is positive, IgM is positive at 5.18 and 6.17 in the CSF and the, the reference range is less than 0.9. IgM is negative at less than 1.3 and the RNA in the PCR and the CSF is undetectable. You guys think that's kind of weird? That the no, it's not very sensitive. PCR, yeah. PCR and the IgM is not detected. I'm sorry? And and also that the IgM is, I'm oh, sorry, the IgG is low. Sorry? Sorry, I'm yeah. I'm okay. yeah, exactly. Good, good. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about West Nile virus. Wow. So this is the sort of working diagnosis in this guy. And fairly, fairly young guy, 32-year-old, uh, uh, to have the sort of neuroinvasive disease but I will talk a little bit more about this. So the vast majority of cases of West Nile virus are asymptomatic. So I estimate between 60 to 80% of people are completely asymptomatic. Um, of those that do develop symptoms, the most common is West Nile fever, which is uh, almost like a flu-like syndrome with fever, myalgias, anorexia, can last about a week. About 25 to 50% of those patients with West Nile fever will develop a, a rash, which is the macular papular rash in the trunk, arms, uh, starts about five days after sy symptom onset, lasts about a week, and I have a picture of it on the next slide. Um, there's some folks that have a prolonged course of the, of the West Nile fever, uh, will get like fatigue, myalgia, is almost like a chronic Lyme picture. Um, and the studies that have been done on this show, it's, this tends to happen more frequently in females and also people who have a higher viremia. Uh, and the neuroinvasive disease is only 1%. And the bottom there is kind of an important thing to note is that the presence of the rash uh, in a person with confirmed West Nile is actually a good prognostic indicator as the rash almost is, uh, is very rarely present in neuroinvasive disease but is fairly common in West Nile, West Nile fever. So this is some pictures of the rash here. Uh, macular papular, uh, trunk, arms, uh, distribution. So the history of West Nile virus um, and so it's a flavivirus, uh, it's a, a positive RNA sense virus. Uh, it gets its name, it was first discovered in Uganda in 1937, uh, published by Smith Byrne in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine in 1940. Um, since 1940, since it was first discovered, there's been outbreaks uh, sporadically throughout Europe and Africa, uh, but never in the United States. That is until 1999. Uh, so there was an outbreak in New York City. The numbers I got on this were slightly different, but it sounded like 62 cases of uh, neuroinvasive disease and uh, upwards of seven deaths. So uh, since that time in 1999, West Nile virus has been seen in all 48 continental United States. Uh, and it's believed that it came into this country through an infected bird 
likely from the Middle East, specifically Israel, as the um, outbreak in Israel, uh, the virus type isolated is uh, very similar to the type that we have in the United States. So now the most common cause of viral encephalitis, amazingly. So. I know you're probably just getting that last statement from the reference. I mean, or herpes. how do we know that it's more common than herpes? Right, right, and I sort of wondered that too. And it's all it's extrapolated okay. from blood donations. So anyway, okay. um, well, I'll talk about that a little bit. But yeah, it's sort of a lot of the data on West Nile, and as far as like the prevalence and things like that, although that's more encephalitis and things like that, is based on extrapolations from positive uh, pooled blood donations. Uh, so anyway, a little bit more on the epidemiology. So I can say up here, so it's senior-cidal. The, cor uh, the correct term is presbycidal. Presbycidal? <laughs> nice. It, it, it takes out Presbyterians or? <laughs> <laughs> unless they're from the elders. Unless they're from Mexico and this is correct. <laughs> so uh, the biggest outbreak was in 2003. Uh, and 50% of the deaths that occurred during that time were in seniors over the age of 77. Uh, children are at lower risk for severe disease, and I'll talk a little bit about the risk factors at different ages later. So less than, like I mentioned, less than 1% of those infected with West Nile develop a severe illness. And of those that develop it, the mortality is anywhere between 3 and 15% and higher in the elderly. Um, 2003 was the, the biggest year uh, that I could find. So uh, 45 states, 2,866 neuroinvasive cases, and 9,862 total cases. So I talk a little bit about how it's believed that it's transmitted, and I'll show you guys a picture on the next page as well. So the mosquito saliva uh, contains the virus. It bites you uh, and injects it through the saliva into the skin, where it infects the Langerhans uh, dendritic cells, which migrates into your lymphatic system. Eventually, you get hematogenous spread to different organs. Uh, it's not really quite known exactly how it gets into the CSF. There's some theories that I'll talk about later, uh, but some people may think it's a, uh, a result of inflammation, TNF-alpha uh, production, that makes your um, blood-brain barrier more permeable and it can somehow get in. So that means that there were actually like 300,000 cases. What do you mean? Well, oh, you have, right, right. You if you're extrapolating the numbers 3, out, right? If it's one percent, and if it's one percent, yeah, yeah. Vast majority are asymptomatic. That means that right. Like oh, yeah. I'll talk about it later because once they started testing the blood supply that year, uh, you start to see exactly how common it is. So uh, timing highest in the human in humans in late summer, early fall. The reason for this: so female mosquitoes uh, are uh, feeding and breeding in the springtime. And as I'll show you in the next page, you build up essentially a bird reservoir um, by the mosquitoes filling, uh, feeding on the birds. The birds become infected. Then subsequent mosquitoes feed on those birds. Then those mosquitoes are infected. The birds also apparently can actually transmit it between each other as well uh, through secretions, which I had no idea. Uh, so in humans, the highest amount of virus or is in the late summer, which is why humans tend to get it in late, late summer. There's other ways that you can get West Nile virus other than mosquito transmission, such as uh, transfusion of blood products, organ donation, uh, needle sticks, uh, vertical transmission, and breastfeeding. Although these things are all fairly rare compared to the mosquito born. So uh, like I talked about, donor blood has been screened since July of 2003. They use a, a pooled uh, RNA amplification uh, so they'll take uh, samples from anywhere between 6 to 12 people, pull it, and then run RNA nucleic acid amplification on that. Um, and, but they also use this data to sort of monitor the seasonal fluctuations and where the endemic areas are. And then extrapolating data from the uh, blood product screening, about 3% of the population is seropositive, uh, and even more in endemic areas. So the life cycle. Uh, this is taken from the CDC on the left, that's an EM on the right. Um, so as I talked about, it starts in the spring uh, where you have the bird, which is the reservoir host, mosquitoes begin feeding on, female mosquitoes begin uh, feeding on the birds and breeding, uh, and then more and more mosquitoes and birds become infected. Eventually that sort of breaks in late summer and you'll get incidental transmission to humans and namely horses. Um, and the species of mosquito responsible in the southeast are listed at the bottom, Culex uh, tarsalis and uh, Quin K. Um 
are the two species that are primarily responsible for transmission in the southeast here. Is that in the previous slide, three percent of the population is zero positive? Mm -hmm. Where, but in some ways those numbers don't add up because if sixty to eighty percent of cases are asymptomatic, uh, clinically asymptomatic. Right. Right. Uh, and we, by definition, live in in an endemic area. Right. Right. And then Is of it, course, what, yeah. I mean, this, all the numbers of, are extrapolated. What percent of the blood supply is <laughs> uh, virus? Positive? Yeah. Um, it, it is not terribly common um, for the virus to be positive, but I'm just talking as far as serology that they find that it's about. 3%. Let me give you guys an example. In Egypt, 50% of kids are seropositive. Right. right. That's so they're not actually virus there. positive. That's why I, I don't I, I don't really believe it's 3%. Yeah. Here in, in the U.S. It should be higher. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the population is higher. Yeah. So um, you guys remember back uh, when at least when I was a lay person and hearing about this stuff, you would hear about all these birds dying. And that was sort of a arbinger that, you know, that this is coming. So during the 2003 outbreak, uh, there was these massive disseminations in bird populations. Uh, one of the things I found was crow populations in endemic areas dropped by actually 90%. But what's interesting is that it's not beneficial at all, the West Nile virus, uh, because you're taking out the reservoir for the virus. Uh, and some of the articles I was looking at said in earlier outbreaks in Europe and in Africa, they weren't seeing this degree of bird death. It's sort of unusual for the United States. Um, but what's, after 2003, there was an enormous drop off in cases. Uh, and part of the reason maybe that there's this massive loss of the reservoir. So if you guys remember, it was nearly 10,000 cases in 2003, where 2004 only had 25,000. I'm sorry, 2000. 539 cases. What's really unfortunate is that it didn't take out 100% of the uh, blue jay and starling population. Yeah, <laughs> that gives you the histo. Well, no, they're, well, just, starling. they're just awful birds. Yeah, and they poop on your car. Okay, so humans are accidental hosts, as I mentioned before. Uh, horses are another uh, animal that seems to be uh, heavily affected by West Nile virus. Um, and horses have a, a higher propensity to develop neurological disease. So 10% uh, of them would develop neurological disease, and of those, 35% would die. So. Can I ask a question while you're there? Okay. Don't they have a vaccine? For horses? Yes. Yeah, they do. But it's not indicated in humans. See, go, I, I hate to harp on this, but going back to the previous slide, the drop-off in cases between 2003 and 2004 yeah. across the country when, when you looked at this outbreak that started in the Northeast sure. and did it year by year, yeah. the incidence of disease was highest in the Northeast the first year. Then it spread from East to West. Kind of gradually moved all the way yeah, to California. Yeah, it moved to California, and the, the thinking at the time was that it had nothing to do with the bird, or had little to do with the bird reservoir, and much more to do with asymptomatic serial conversion against infection where you had an, uh, essentially uh, an immune population. Mm -hmm. But you can't get that sort of, of, of epidemic uh, geography with a 3% zero population. Right, you would expect it to be a lot higher. Right. Okay. Very good. Yeah, last year I showed those slides. It's not very good, it's confusing to me. <laughs> okay. Point is taken. All right, so uh, this is straight out of the CDC. So um, this is the sort of incidence maps that we have per 100,000 100, population. You can see that Mississippi is actually one of the higher um, states. Yeah. Go Mississippi. <laughs> Last in education, first in West Nile. So um, a little bit about the sort of immunology of West Nile virus. This is mainly uh, different animal studies, things I was looking at. So, um, it's, West Nile infectivity and viremia is strongly correlated with the degree of antibody production that you have, and also with neuroinvasive disease. So, uh, the theory is that earlier on, if you have a high antibody response, um, your risk of neuroinvasive disease is much less. Uh, so, I was talking a little bit about here, B-cell deficient mice have a higher mortality at lower viral loads. 
um, also those with interferon alpha and, and beta receptor knockout mice, and complement deficiency also had uh, higher risks of CNS dissemination and death. Um, and so, like I mentioned, rapid development of high antibody titers results in less severe disease. Uh, Toll-like receptors, so the toll-like receptor 3 um, may also be implicated in um, actually increasing the risk of neuroinvasive disease. So toll-like receptor 3 uh, increases cytokines in TNF-alpha, and I mentioned before it's not really known how it gets into the, into the blood-brain barrier, but one of the theories is that if you uh, increase production of TNF-alpha, it makes your blood-brain barrier essentially more permeable to the virus. So uh, mice that had knockouts in TRL3 had decreased TNF-alpha and had decreased neuroinvasive disease. So, um, and then I also kind of threw this in there, CCR5, which a lot of people know uh, with HIV, um, mutations in CCR5 may be or is associated with less HIV infectivity, but in West Nile virus, it's ex exactly the opposite, where you get increased susceptibility to neuro West Nile virus. And the theory behind that is that CCR5 helps with chemo migration of T cells into the CNS. So transplant recipients, um, how do they vary as far as, you know, versus normal immunocompromised or competent hosts? Um, and they've seen that in transplant re recipients, they'll have similar presentation, but are much more likely to have a severe uh, neuroinvasive disease. So this is a little bit about the serology. We sort of hinted on this a little bit earlier. Um, and you can see IgM uh, basically rises first and will stay elevated actually for quite a long time. So the different testing that you have available for you. So ELISA um, is gonna be your, your mainstay. The IgM typically becomes positive in average about four days, IgG in about eight days. Uh, and it takes 156 days on average for IgM to become negative. Uh, this is pretty important. You can get a false positive IgM if you've been infected with other flaviviruses like dengue or St. Louis. Um, and some have even said that if you get a, like a recent yellow fever vaccination, you can have a false positive. So uh, the RNA-PCR, not a very good test, um, as we were sort of mentioning earlier. Uh, time to undetectable RNA is 13 days. And if you have a low degree of viremia, uh, your PCR may not be positive. So uh, from the IDSA, they said that less than 60% of PCR was positive in patients with uh, neuroinvasive disease. So uh, the plaque reduction, reduction nuclear test, was stated to be the most specific test. You can also do, you can also culture it, but that's somewhat dangerous, so it's not really done. Um, so that test for the donor series ability to clear plaques, that way you're not getting uh, the sort of cross-reactivity, like I mentioned, with other flaviviruses. So, um, so what about um, your laboratory? So CSF profile typically shows pleocytosis, elevated protein, normal glucose. Uh, don't be thrown off by a neutrophilic predominance. Um, they were saying about 40% of the cases will have actually a neutrophilic predominance on the top. So CT, uh, not very good for West Nile virus. It can help you rule out other things uh, that could be causing ultramental status like a interparenchymal hemorrhage. Uh, MRI, also not a terribly great test. Um, you can see on diffusion-weighted imaging some signal abnormalities, but it's only present 20 to 40% of the time. Uh, tends to be a hyper-intense signal in the basal ganglia or thalamine. And EEG shows a generalized continuous slowing, which our guy actually had. Uh, so West Nile virus in pregnancy, this is out of uh, MMWR. So I mentioned before, you can actually get it through breast milk, and there have been at least one case of this happening. Uh, but CDC actually doesn't recommend cessation of breastfeeding because um, it's not really quite understand how frequently this is happening. Um, there's also been cases of West Nile virus obtained through vertical transmission. And, um, but the vast majority of mothers that acquire West Nile virus, virus while pregnant have no complications. Screening is not re recommended um, for the mothers, but if a, an infant is born to a mother that has known West Nile virus during pregnancy, it's recommended that they get uh, serum tested for IgM and IgG at days two and uh, week eight. Uh, so this is kind of a busy table, but it shows uh, neuroinvasive disease cases. This is this year, uh, so 2000, January to September, um, broken down by state, and you see um, two in Tennessee, but areas where it's more common. Uh, Mississippi, 16, way to go, and compare that to a large population center like California, which only has 20, so. Shows you how good the reporting system is. In Mississippi, at least. Yeah. Everywhere. Good work. Um, 
Neuroinvasive disease, like I said, 1% of all cases higher in elderly and immunocompromised. Different features that you'll see, fever, mental status changes, ataxia, memory problems, seizures, um, flaccid paralysis, polyradiculitis, myelitis, tremor, myoclonus, cranial nerve palsies. I thought this was kind of interesting. So the eighth cranial nerve can be involved, which you can get nystagmus, and it's actually been really associated with opsoclonus, myoclonus. Um, you can either have meningitis, encephalitis, or both. Uh, it has a slightly, uh, slightly tends to favor encephalitis. Um, IgM will be positive in 90% of the patients that have West Nile virus encephalitis uh, simply because of the time frame uh, involved where neuroinvasive disease will usually develop, you know, four or five days after initial infection. So um, West Nile poliomyelitis is a very rare sort of manifestation where you can get asymmetric limb weakness and paralysis without sensory loss. Can involve the respiratory muscles leading to rapid respiratory failure. Um, involves the anterior horn cells and motor neurons where you get virus infectivity. Um, and these patients tend to be the more younger patients. And I put all these things up here uh, because in our patient, uh, he did have some abnormal um, EMGs and did develop somewhat rapid respiratory failure. So uh, just a thing to remember, a little good clinical pro, children are more likely to develop meningitis, elderly and immunocompromised are more likely to develop encephalitis. Um, so treatment, unfortunately what we have right now is uh, mainly supportive care, but different things have been tried. Um, interferon has been tried. All of these things have, uh, are, have only been in limited sort of cases on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but there have been patients that have had very severe neurological problems that have had somewhat rapid improvement uh, with interferon within 48 hours of initial presentation and initial uh, neurological involvement. Uh, corticosteroids, I couldn't find that much info on this, but uh, they did a study on dogs that showed that dogs that had re received high dose IV steroids for a month um, were compared versus placebo dogs all infected with West Nile virus. And the dogs that had gotten steroids had 40 to 50 per, uh, times higher viremia, uh, but didn't have any changes in the actual outcome of the disease, strangely enough. Uh, IVIG is sort of a mixed bag. It's probably going to be better if it's if it's taken and pulled from areas where West Nile virus is common so um, that you would have the antibodies in uh, the, I, the IVIG that's given uh, from those donors. Uh, so studies in animals have shown some benefit if given at the onset of neurosymptoms somewhat like interferon and the ribavirin is a big no-no. Uh, don't give ribavirin uh, in animals, it shows higher mortality. They tried during the um, Israel outbreak in 2003 and gave ribavirin, and those patients that got it had higher mortality with neuroinvasive uh, West Nile virus. So uh, as far as vaccines, there's none currently on the market other than the horse vaccine that you had mentioned. Uh, but the one that shows a lot of promise, there's a few that show promise, but the, the Chimeravax WNO2 actually shows quite a bit of promise. And it's made, um, it actually just got through phase two human trials this year. So it's a single dose, live, attenuated chimeric vaccine uh, where they combine different parts of West Nile virus with uh, yellow fever uh, virus. So it's essentially the membrane and envelope proteins from West Nile are inserted into the yellow fever vaccine. Uh, so the patients that got it, uh, and I'll show you guys some of the tables from this uh, paper from the phase two trials. Um, greater than 95% had positive IgM after 28 days. They tested in all sorts of different age range and the efficacy in the different age ranges was pretty similar. Uh, right around 95% had positive IgM after 28 days. Uh, very well tolerated uh, symptom profile was very similar to placebo. Uh, other vaccines are sort of in the pipeline uh, based on different methodology. Uh, DNA vaccines, uh, a vectorized vaccine, a live attenuated vaccine recombinant common in subunit. Uh, but the one I was seeing a lot of interest in was this Chimera Vax. I was waiting for the Dale to spring up and demand the justification for the statement efficacy. Yeah, I'm, I what do you mean by efficacy? That. You mean it's not, it's not efficacy? You mean what it provokes mean? an immune response? Yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, they weren't exposed to the virus. Right, 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 right. Virus. Okay, yeah, you're right. You're right. I was looking at a slide like efficacy. Right. They do. It promotes a strong IgM response. That's correct. And the proper word is immunogenicity. Okay. Thanks. How many people are they immunized with? 
How many people have been immunized with this? Um, these phase one and two trials. If on, on this particular one right here, it's about 100 on this phase two trial right here. Okay. So, and this is sort of the breakdown. If you look at the um, the bottom, you can either look at the bottom half of the table has the breakdown um, by years or in the different age groups. So 41 to uh, 64, greater than 65. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the, bo the bottom has the, so let me correct myself, the bottom has the different um, uh, doses that were given. So, um, I'm sorry, the top has the different doses that are given. The bottom has the different ages. Uh, and you can see at 28 days, so at the very bottom here, let me move my mouse down here. Um, this is IgM, pres uh, presence of IgM after 28 days. So we're looking at, uh, so this is 41 to 64 years old, 93%, uh, greater than 65 had 96% had positive IgM, and greater than 41 had 94% where control had, of course, zero. So. Uh, so a lot of the focus right now until we get a good vaccine or treatment down the road is really in, in prevention. So mosquito control pro, uh, programs, very similar with other arthropod uh, diseases have been. So elimination of stagnant water, uh, control of mosquito populations, uh, personal protection using DEETs containing bug, bug sprays, uh, use of long sleeve clothing, long pants and avoiding uh, areas that we're going to have a high percentage of mosquitoes, such as wood areas. Uh, so back to the original patient. Uh, the patient's given IVIG by neurology. He doesn't really improve. Uh, he's unable to be uh, extubated, has prolonged respiratory failure, vent dependence. He's eventually trached. Uh, he has paralysis in the upper lower extremities, but uh, up until recent, actually up Recently, he started to improve in his mental status and functional ability. Uh, now he's actually able to communicate with you, write messages, and he can move all extremities. But he still has uh, some difficulty with moving his extremities. Anyway. Uh, Dr. Dale?